so today we we have uh, uh, the first talk is Javier Duarte. He's going to talk about um, a relatively recently funded uh, DOE project called Fair for Hub. As Peter said, so uh, my name is Javier Duarte. I'm an assistant professor at University of California, San Diego. Uh, and today we're talking about the Fair for HEP project. Uh, so first, uh, let me just say I'm presenting on behalf of this uh, great team, uh, including uh, scientists from Argonne, uh, UIUC, NCSA, MIT, and University of Minnesota. Uh, and we are funded by the uh, Department of Energy. Uh, and so what is Fair for HEP or what's our, our purpose? So it's a DOE Oscar funded collaboration. It's a three year project. Uh, and essentially our, our goal is to advance the under, our understanding of the relationship between our data and AI models in high energy physics uh, by empowering scientists to explore both essentially in the relationships between the two uh, through development of frameworks adhering to the principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability, which is a mouthful. So instead we use the acronym uh, FAIR. Uh, and these are sort of general principles that are used uh, in, in other parts of data science as well. Uh, so using high energy physics as, a, as the science use case, uh, we want to investigate fair ways to share AI, our AI models and data, uh, create an environment where these where novel approaches to AI can be explored and applied to new data, uh, and ultimately, hopefully, enable new insights for applying AI techniques. Uh, so we're not doing this in a vacuum. We're trying to sort of collaborate uh, with partners, including the CERN Open Data Portal, uh, Zenodo, and DL Hub, uh, which you may, uh, some of you may already be familiar with, these services. Um, and we're also trying to operate within the larger community, uh, including the Australian Research Data Commons, which has lots of uh, ARDC, which has lots of programs to uh, promote fairness in data science um, and the Research Data Alliance. Uh, and one interesting thing to note is that today there is this uh, birds of a feather um, on FAIR for machine learning uh, as part of the uh, RDA, um, as part of an RDA meeting. Uh, and that was actually led and, and participated in with some of the members from our FAIR for HEP team. So as an outline for the rest of the, the talk, um, I'll briefly kind of lay out the motivation. So why is this a useful thing to do uh, of applying fair, fair principles in high energy physics? Um, then I'll sort of delineate a little bit the fair principles to, to get everyone on the same page as to what they are. Um, and then I'll go into our fair for HEP, our sort of ongoing projects, uh, one of which is developing fair standards for data and AI in high energy physics. Uh, and then developing example fair data sets and AI models. And I'll talk about a couple of examples, uh, although there's, there's others we are working on, uh, and then kind of give you the long-term vision and outlook. So for the first uh, sort of motivation uh, is essentially to create new reference data sets for high energy physics. Uh, and this is to try to engage the machine learning community, the broader data science and machine learning community uh, to work on our problems, basically, uh, for interesting and realistic tasks in experimental high energy physics. So, of course, the, the famous example here is that ImageNet uh, really accelerated advances in computer vision, so we really want to do the same thing for high energy physics. Uh, and as you may know, there are already sort of many existing data sets out there. Uh, so data sets, for example, for uh, top quark tagging, uh, for tracking, for charged particle tracking, um, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit about a data set for Higgs to BB, tagging uh, Higgs boson decaying to two bottom quarks uh, based on CMS open simulation, and also a data, data set for particle flow reconstruction. Uh, and we're also in preparing a data set for sort of more low level detector calibration. So this is for the CMS ECAL crystal calorimeter. Um, but in general, we want to sort of promote these data sets to be uh, uh, interesting data sets to apply new techniques in, even outside of just our, our field. Uh, so the second motivation is to really allow uh, sharing and reusing of AI models across Sorry, one second. Uh, to allow sharing and reusing of AI models across high energy physics. So as one example, uh, recently, uh, Atlas actually studied uh, GraphNet, which is a um, a point cloud, essentially a, a graph neural network for point cloud segmentation. Uh, and this model was actually originally developed by CMS collaborators and used in CMS and used in, in for various uh, uh, 
um, tasks uh, also for looking at the upgrade of, of the HGCal. Uh, and as you can see, it's one example of a, clearly a model that has uh, usability or reusability across different experiments. Um, then the third motivation is really this uh, thing about exploring the relationship between data and AI models. Uh, so, of course, one aspect of this is to make it easier to build upon existing work. So, for example, through transfer learning, where, you know, a model that was trained on one data set. So, for example, on the left, you see this exception uh, model being trained on ImageNet, but then applied to galaxies to try to see how, uh, the, how the clustering looks in the latent space of this model. And as you can see, it doesn't really work that well to cluster galaxies um, because it's trained on a very different data set. But after some fine tuning, so some retraining on the on galaxy data, then you can sort of clearly see two uh, different kinds of galaxy clusters uh, be identified in this in this with this model. Uh, so that's one way to sort of explore: okay, which models are good for which data sets, and how how can they be adapted to different data sets? Um, and we also want to share the work beyond high energy physics. So uh, there is examples of uh, so, for example, AI models developed for HEP specific tasks. Uh, that we're doing. So right now we're, we're working with a lot of point cloud data. So for example, in CMS for the HGCal and reconstructing HGCal data. Uh, so how can we, uh, so it may be possible to reuse these kinds of models uh, to look at other point cloud data. So for instance, uh, like LIDAR point cloud data, which is very useful for potentially self-driving cars and other applications outside of high energy physics. Uh, okay, so that's the, basically the main motivation. So I can talk a little bit now about what are the fair data principles that we, we want to apply. Um, and so these are the ones that, that apply, that are sort of well-defined for data. And so the first kind of go under the category of findable. So uh, they kind of describe requirements that you want your data to have. Uh, so one of them is that the data and the metadata uh, so both A, both have to exist, and B, uh, they should have a unique and persistent identifier like a DOI. Uh, the data should be described by this metadata, uh, and it should have a lot of information in it. Uh, the metadata should also specify what is the identifier of the data. And then finally, both the data and the metadata should be registered in a sort of searchable index, searchable uh, database, so that you can actually find the data. Uh, the second is, category is essentially accessibility. Uh, and so this means that the data and meta, data, metadata should be retrievable using this identifier. So for example, a DOI using some standardized protocol, communication protocol, and this should be uh, open, free, and universally implementable. So it should be something that is, is pretty standard. Uh, and it could also potentially allow for authentication if, if it's necessary. Um, and this metadata should really be accessible even when the data is not. So it's really, uh, persistent. Uh, then there's the principles of interoperability. Uh, what this means is you really want systems to be able to talk to each other without necessarily a human in the loop. Uh, and so what this means is that uh, the metadata and the data need to have a formal uh, shared and broadly applicable language to represent the knowledge. Uh, one good thing to do is use vocabularies that follow fair principles. So um, uh, and that's kind of the, there's kind of a standard definition to that. Um, and then the metadata can also include references to other types of data and metadata so that there's links between the different, da different data sets. Uh, and then finally, uh, reusability. So this means that the data and the metadata should have uh, basically uh, lots of uh, accurate and relevant attributes. Uh, and there should be sort of clear and accessible data license so that you can actually reuse it. Uh, and it should also tell you what the provenance is so you know how to, let's say, reproduce that data if you needed to. Uh, and it's at all, it should also meet domain relevant community standards. So uh, in high energy physics, this would mean like, you know, kind of some idea of how this data could actually be reused. So like, you know, what, uh, you know, what are the conditions in which it was created? And then like, what are the limitations, let's say, of, of being able to reuse it? Okay, so those are uh, the fair data principles. Um, but as you can see, they may or may not be perfectly uh, they, let's say there's different ways to interpret those principles. So one project that we have in, in this Fair for HEP uh, program is really to uh, interpret and refine these fair standards for both data and AI in high energy physics. Uh, so uh, essentially what, our, uh, what this project 
uh, entails is one, one part of it is to try to understand which data sets in which public data sets for Henry physics are actually fair. And so this means essentially refining. Uh, so then, uh, so we'd like to understand essentially which uh, HEP public data sets are fair. Uh, and so we'd also want to be able to do this more generally for all of our data sets. So we what we would like to do is develop a, and refine a fair checklist, let's say, for HEP data sets. Uh, and so while this is well defined, uh, although open to interpretation, uh, one thing that's not really well defined yet is what fair even means for AI models. Uh, so that's one thing that we, we'd really like to focus on is how to define fairness for things uh, like a, objects like AI models. Uh, and then once we have that definition, we can try to develop sort of a standard protocol to follow in order to publish your AI model as a quote unquote fair uh, AI model. Uh, and so once we have sort of these, these protocols set up, then we can try to explore how users can contribute their own fair data and AI model. So it's not just sort of us contributing these, but actually any user that, that says, hey, I have a data set. Hey, I have an AI model. I want, I want to uh, can make it fair and then contribute it to some, uh, some repository. Uh, and then as users adopt these fair for HEP standards, uh, hopefully it will be easier to publish citable AI models. So uh, it'll be you know, clear that this AI model has this DOI and uh, was created by this person and, and we can sort of reuse it in different contexts uh, and also retrain publish these, these published AI models on new and uh, hopefully also fair data sets. Uh, and then extend these, these AI models for new tasks. And ultimately, like I said before, explore the relationships between these models and, and data. So that's sort of one project, which is really about, uh, it's, it's really the overarching project, but just uh, uh, also about conceptualizing what, how to interpret FAIR for different uh, tasks in high energy physics. So the, let's see, there we go. Uh, so then uh, as part of that, some of the ongoing projects we have are to actually develop example fair data sets and AI models to sort of give that uh, to people as, okay, here's an example of how you can actually do this for your own models and data sets. Uh, and so we want to sort of advance important tasks in high physics with reference data sets. So actually public, publish more open data sets, um, but also uh, along with them AI models that, that have you know, some of these attributes of fairness and explore the you know the fairness criteria for both. So see how 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 fair we can make both of these these things. Uh, so I'll talk about a couple of the tasks that we're uh, focusing on right now. But as I said, there's many different tasks. So there's that we're thinking about. So Higgs VB jet tagging, particle flow reconstruction, ECAL crystal calibration, level one trigger jet reconstruction, charge particle tracking, among among many others. And we're always welcome to feedback if people are interested in other tasks or thinking about other models. Uh, so uh, the first task is uh, tagging Higgs bosons uh, decaying to bottom quarks. Uh, so of course this branching ratio is, is very large, but it's difficult to analyze uh, this process because of the immense backgrounds. So obviously uh, gluons can split to two bottom quarks and, and do at a much higher rate than you get the production of a Higgs boson. Uh, so we really need to uh, focus on the machine learning based identification of these Higgs to BB jets in order to be able to measure, uh, to do anything with this, with this uh, final state, this important final state. Uh, and so one data set that was developed by CMS and published on the CERN open data, set, data portal is this Higgs to BB jet tagging data set. Um, and so I should say a quick word about the CERN open data portal. It's a collaborative effort between the CERN IT and, and, and the LHC experiments. Uh, it's built with uh, this Invenio library management software, which is the same as, as Zenodo. Uh, the products, uh, so the data, the software, the documentation, the provenance are all shared under open licenses and issued DOIs. So it is sort of going uh, a long way towards, towards being uh, fully fair. Uh, and it has EOS data storage. So you can access the data sets via XRootD or HTTP. Uh, so the Higgs BB data set itself, uh, you can find by like searching on the, the portal there. Uh, has a DOI, it has uh, about 245 gigabytes and has features relevant to Higgs dbb tagging available in both root format and HDF5 format. So uh, maybe a slightly more machine learning friendly format. Um, okay, so then one question we had uh, is, is this HBB jet tagging dataset fair? 
And right now we're actually in the process of evaluating the fairness and contributing feedback back to the CERN open data portal and implementing ways to improve its, its fairness score, basically. Uh, and this is similar to the ARDC fairness self-assessment tool. Uh, so we like looked a little bit at that and we're also developing kind of our own uh, guide. And so, yeah, the idea is to basically take the lessons learned from this exercise and uh, create a guide on evaluating fairness more generally for the HEP community. So you can essentially take this uh, and transfer it to all the other data sets that any other data that you might be interested in, in making fair and essentially elevate it to that, to that standard. So related to this, uh, there's, a, a, we also want to explore, you know, the fairness of AI models. So we have uh, an AI model that's a sort of a benchmark uh, that can be used on this data set. Uh, and this is a, a publication that, that uh, I, I was an author of, which is a, a graph neural network to identify these Higgs to BB jets. Um, and as you can see here, it's a graph neural network. It improves uh, quite a bit on previous methods that were used. Uh, and the model and code are available publicly, um, although it's, not, it's very much not fair. I, would, I wouldn't call it fair. Uh, so one part of the project that we have is to try to actually expand on this and, and make it fair. Um, so, Actually, I uh, worked a little bit on making a, this simpler and more easier, e easy to understand this model uh, because I had to teach a UCSD data science uh, capstone uh, course. So here there is a sort of more uh, factorized and, and more tutorial based uh, example of this graph neural network with PyTorch Geometric. Uh, so if you're familiar with PyTorch Geometric, this should hopefully be uh, a simple, much simpler way to express graph neural networks. Um, and the environment is kind of fully specified with Docker because they're data science students. So they're like, oh, what's the Docker container? You know, so they, they, they wanted that information. Uh, and so uh, this already has this sort of self-contained environment uh, in order for you to be able to deploy this model and, and train it on the public data set. Uh, and so the idea is to sort of expand this tutorial, this example, into a fully fledged fair AI model that could be hosted, for example, on DL Hub, which is one of, one of the partners we want to work with uh, at, at Argon. Okay, so that's uh, about the Higgs to BB task. And then I'll, I'll just say a quick word on the, this other task of particle flow reconstruction. So of course, this task is uh, important because particles interact with the detector and then they leave energy deposits and tracks. But what we're actually interested in is, is the particles. So the, part, the, so the PF algorithm essentially combines information from these different uh, subsystems to produce a holistic uh, interpretation of the event. Uh, and the goal is basically to, to try to minimize the error, the distance between these truth particles and these reconstructed particles. And so we already have a public data set uh, and AI model, uh, which are hosted on, on Zenodo and GitHub, uh, but we wanna actually make, you know, go the extra mile to make these things fair, as I, as I said earlier. So just another example of an of a interesting task that could be used uh, across experiments and across, uh, yeah, high energy physics. Okay, so then uh, take another minute, sorry, if I'm going over to uh, give the sort of the long-term vision and the, and the summary. Uh, so in the sort of long-term, we have these data repositories like open, the Open Data Portal and Zenodo. Uh, we also you know, want to be able to deploy our AI models and you know, their code. The code is hosted in, for example, GitHub, and then maybe we have the environment on Docker, but we wanna be able to like, you know, deploy this with Kubernetes or Binder or something. Um, and then we also have our publications, which uh, we often use to actually search and discover new models and, and think about how, uh, you know, we, we often use that, those. We don't usually search GitHub directly. We, we often go to like archive to find out, oh, what are the, the new things that are coming out? So uh, of course, uh, then there's this nice linking between these two things, which is papers with code. It's a nice service that kind of lets you link, oh, here's a GitHub uh, that implements this model, let's say that was hosted on, on that, that, that is implemented uh, corresponding to this archive paper. Um, and that could actually help to help you discover both the model, not just, and, and potentially the data set as well. Uh, then there's also competition. So we might wanna like actually make this a more uh, open thing related to competitions. Um, but ultimately what we wanna do is sort of link all these different features together so that it can make it easier to uh, essentially go between the data, the publication, and the AI models, let's say, you know, hosted on GitHub or hosted in this, these different uh, services. 
uh, and then actually retrain them. So like use services like MLflow or Rihanna or DL Hub to actually uh, instantiate these models, train them on different kinds of computing resources, uh, and then you know, plug in new, new data sets, plug in new computing resources. Uh, so ultimately there's like this vision of actually connecting all these things together uh, and making things more, more discoverable that way. Okay, so to summarize, uh, so the goal of FAIR for HEP is to interpret and refine what FAIR means for HEP data and models. Uh, we wanna enable sort of plug and play data sets and allow for combinations of different computing resources. Uh, so uh, as I showed you on the previous slide, the, the vision sort of connecting all these services that link data sets, uh, AI models, and then uh, ways to deploy these things. And then also of course the publications to make everything more fair and allow for a simpler, just simpler discovery of new data sets and models. Uh, we have some ongoing projects that go in this direction. So uh, right now we're evaluating, so fairness of existing public data sets. Um, and then we're trying to standardize the fair publication of AI models in high energy physics uh, and create example fair data sets and AI models. Uh, and ultimately uh, kind of contribute this back to the community by enhancing the existing services to make them more fair. So. And of course, we welcome any feedback. So thank you. OK, excellent, interesting. Um, questions? And we, we want uh, Brian. So, so um, on your, I think it was the previous slide where you had all the different components that, that interact there. Yeah, what, one thing that uh, bit me or, or uh, we had a sudden realization on last year was how lousy Docker Hub actually is for things like archiving or or being you know you know, you know even finding uh, software environments uh, uh, for the fact that if you don't pay them they they will delete start deleting your tags after six months uh, if there's not enough usage uh, which uh, <laughs> would be unfortunate if if they decided that you're your data set wasn't interesting and, and there it goes. Do you have a vision for how that, I, I know there's kind of an arrow from GitHub to Zenodo. Do you have a vision for how the, you know, the, the Docker, the container environments get archived and uh, reproduced as, as part of these uh, you know, recasting, retraining? Yes, that's a good question. So, uh, from the CERN side, I mean, there is sort of uh, container services through like GitLab, through like CERN's sort of own hosted GitLab. So that is like, I guess a possible, but not ultimately totally general solution. Um, I think there are some alternatives to, to Docker Hub that uh, again, they're, mostly they're, I guess, private instances of, you know, different, uh, either GitLab repositories or uh, registries, I guess I should say. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. I think we need to think about how to really uh, persist uh, the storage of container, of like container environments. Um, yeah. yeah, I think there, yeah. Yeah, eventually I'd love to see um, an arrow from kind of Docker to Zenodo, right? In terms of, you know, I. I, I trust Zenodo to keep my data for the next 30 years. I, I do not trust a, a venture capitalist funding for 30 years. Right, right. That's a good point. Uh, Katarina? It's going to be a bit noisy. That also explains my attempts of profiting your slide up in the outdoors right now. Um, so this was a really nice, this is a really nice effort and I, I really like the, the idea that this is going on. Uh, two points that I, I don't know if you've thought about. Uh, the first one is about the, the sort of authorship and ownership of the code. If you put something out on Zenodo uh, and someone actually makes the effort of making this data plus code fair and sustainable, is it something that uh, you think putting the label the CMS collaboration will be sufficient? Like, is there enough incentive for people to do this? Uh, that's the, the first question. And the, the second question is uh, connected to somehow the, uh, what, what you said before about the venture capitalists. So do we, 
do we trust physicists to maintain this code for a very long period of time? So what's the life cycle of this? Yes, uh, both good questions. So I think, so for the first, um, yeah, we we do, I think as a community need to incentivize more the, the process of making, you know, our science both reproducible and reusable. Um, so wait as to ways to incentivize this, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure we, we've, uh, thought about it too much other than, well, you know, if you do that work, there is obvious benefits in that, well, more people will probably use your work and cite you. And if that's something that is, you know, an incentive that to you, then that, that could potentially, uh, help. But yeah, yeah, Javier, um, yeah. I agree in terms of like more, you know, better citability and also just people using, I think the, one of the incentives you, you said is, is right that, you know, having your having your uh, data and or models in this framework makes it more you know uh uh more widely you know available and, and known to people and people can extend your models which should be something i think everybody would be interested in in having a legacy on so i think if this is properly formed yeah there could be you know mo good motivations just just for you know i put a model together and if people people use it and extend it and apply it to other fields that's something that everybody should be interested in so that, I think that's the main incentive, which is basically what you said, but I just thought I'd elaborate. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the second one, yeah, about which services to trust. Um, so again, this, this has to do with, I think, uh, having a DOI. So like we said, you know, so GitHub is, is a useful service for hosting our, you know, code, but then ultimately, right, the real preserver will be some, a service like Zenodo, which will give it a persistent identifier like a DOI and then sort of uh, actually archive, you know, the code, you know, from, from a particular GitHub uh, repository. So I do think we need that same analogy for all aspects of, of the AI model. So if it's, you know, the AI model's code, okay, th this kind of bridge already exists. If it's the container that, you know, is able to, uh, that has the, the machine learning framework that you use to, to actually run the code, that again is, is needs to be a similar, there needs to be a similar bridge to a service that will essentially preserve, archive, and uh, I, preserve and identify this, this thing for the future. Thank you. Gordon. Uh, yeah, I had a, um, a question or comment, but um, Brian uh, also had another one and he had to leave the meeting. So I thought I'd just uh, read it to get your response. So Brian says, um, apologies, I need to drop off to my next meeting. One thing to think about is what, uh, or what are the roles of uh, journals here? Journals serve as a credentialing organizations, someone who, uh, who says that a paper meets a certain level of quality. Perhaps there's a similar analogy here. Could journals help put good data sets out of you know, the unwashed matches, masses? I was wondering if you wanted that's, to. That's a great question, yeah. So one role journals could play, which we could encourage them to play, is already some, some journals have a requirement about the data availability statement, things like this. We could you know, ask them to revise that and really think about not just whether the data is available, and available could really mean like somebody could paste the web page link that then like, you know, is broken the next, the next day after the, pub after the, the publication's out. Um, so, but really having the data set availability mean fair, you know, the, the data set satisfies fair principles. And also then that the, the code also satisfies, you know, fair software principles or fair AI principles. Um, that could be one mechanism that actually would incentivize people to do it because then it's like, okay, to get this thing published that then I actually need this as well. Um, and then in terms of, getting them to actually evaluate the fairness of different data sets. I think there are some uh, publications that deal specifically with, with data sets. So like data journals and, and software journals. And that could be something we could interface with those uh, two types of journals more to see if that, that could be something that, uh, I think that's already essentially in their purview and that could be something that could be extended as well. 
Great. And I was going to say you reminded me that there are some journals where uh, part of getting your paper approved is that one of the reviewers is actually able to reproduce mm -hmm. your uh, steps or, or uh, work. Um, uh, Peter, do I still have time to ask a question or are we uh, running short and need to switch over? Uh, Jan, is it okay if Gordon gets in one more quick question? Sure. Uh, thanks, Jan. Um, so uh, on this slide that you've got up right now, um, there's lots of arrows uh, between the various different uh, pieces. And you already mentioned how at least one of them works, right? The, the, arc of, uh, the archives um, papers with code uh, link. Um, what about all of these other uh, arrows? I mean, I, I guess one of the main things here is how to approach all of uh, and, and, and code or, or preserve uh, all of these arrows. Is everything just in, say, Zenodo and then can and uh, open data, uh, maybe? And then from there, everything can be instantiated into a service, but it's not really stored anywhere but Zenodo. How, how do you imagine these arrows actually, actually existing? in a, I guess, uh, fair, uh, fair way. Yeah, so potentially, yeah, I think my arrows maybe are, could be drawn a little bit smarter. Um, but yeah, it, it may not be true that there will be arrows between every single service, but instead, like, as long as some path exists, right, that lets you let you go between point A and point B, that that might be uh, sufficient. So for instance, like, uh, DL Hub might be a good place to actually host the AI models, the host the AI models, and then uh, you, and then this could then have a link to you know the GitHub repo and to Zenodo, like the Zenodo DOI for that model, um, and from that Zenodo link, that could also link that'll link back and reference the paper, uh, and so yeah, it might be that there's only sort of one direction, and then there might not be any connection, let's say necessarily between DL Hub, which hosts the AI model and the paper, but you can kind of go through the arc and, and kind of go back and figure out what are all the things that, that are connected. And then of course the paper will cite other papers. And, um, but I guess the, the real thing that I, I was hoping to get out with this slide, and I, I had another slide that I actually removed, which is that let's say I'm interested in one data set and I'm, and I want to like say, hey, what are other relevant data sets? What are similar data sets that I could uh, train, you know, or explore and look at different models? So basically, I want to be able to go from data set to data set and also from data set to AI model that works on that data set. And then once I'm at that AI model, also know, hey, what other data sets does this AI model work for and sort of explore things this way. And so uh, that's kind of what I was trying to get at with this as well. But, um, but yeah, I think there's Lot, a lot to be considered and, and worked on to get to that point. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're running a few minutes over. So I guess, uh, thanks again, it's a really nice talk. And we look, for, I'm, I certainly look forward to seeing if there's ways some of the rest of us can collaborate on this. Um, so why don't we switch to uh, Jan's talk now? So, okay, great. Thank you very much for inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to um, present software and computing technology and rec uh, technology requirements and opportunities. Uh, so this is a, a talk I gave at the uh, Slack workshop last fall. Um, this is just a starting point um, for discussion. So, you know, please feel free to interrupt me during the meeting. Um, the, the talk was geared for a shorter, what was about 15 minutes plus five for, for um, Question. So, so this is kind of where we are right now, and I'm not going to go through all of this in, in all of the, the great detail. Um, so I hope we have a, a little bit of time for, for discussions afterwards. So this is uh, basically just to, to give you an, an overview over where we are and, and uh, what the opportunities are if you're interested in joining um, or getting started with, with ILC activities. Um, so just to start off with the political side, um, we have recently created this, this uh, IDT, the International Development Team. Um, that team is tasked to set up a pre-lab and we are hopeful that the pre-lab will start April 1st next year. The pre-lab 
would live for four years and the pre-lab is then uh, the, the organization that will set up the proper ILC lab with the physical host site and, and get everything uh, ready so that construction can, can restart. Um, so the pre-lab would be mostly based on inter-lab negotiations and the, ID, the ILC proper would then be uh, based on intergovernmental negotiations and, and agreements similar to, to CERN. Um, so we live in this, and, and I see Frank is connected as well. Thank you very much. Um, we live in this uh, working group three of this international development team and in the uh, software and computing working group. So here's a, an overview over the greater org chart over this of this uh, working group three with the mandates. And if you're interested in learning more about this, then just go to lineacollider.org and, and you'll find your way to our mandate and, and the other people that are working on this. Okay, so let's get started with um, the, the proper part of the presentation, computing requirements. Uh, so this drives the detector requirements, of course. Um, it looks very different from the LHC. So I'm just gonna give you a, a brief overview here. Um, we operate at about five Hertz and with five Hertz, I mean five Hertz between these bunch trains. One train comes in 1,312 bunches. The detectors basically stay open, integrate over these bunches, then get read out during this quiet time between the bunches um, before the next bunch comes. So overall, the environment is a lot quieter than what you've just seen. Um, I don't exactly know what, what event this is. This is just some, some generic 4 event. event. Um, but you can see that there's a lot less activity, so it's, it's a lot um, easier to do the analysis and, and the detectors have, like I said, very different requirements, more on precision rather than, than readout speed and, and radiation hardness. Uh, so we have billions of pixels in, the, in these detectors, uh, very high fidelity. The raw data size is uh, fairly large, um, 280 megabytes per train. And if we integrate all of this up, we expect about 14 petabytes per year, and we expect to have two experiments. Okay, so then just a quick word on the computing model. Um, that's something we're working on, and that's something that that specifically this this working group that I just mentioned this is tasked with um, updating. This was from 2014. Um, the main requirement here is that the detectors live in a in a mountain site, and the main campus is a little bit further away than CERN is from the detectors. So. Um, our T1 has a little bit more um, distance to the actual experiment. Um, that's the main difference. Then the rest is, is fairly standard. Um, like I said, this was from 2014. HPC resources aren't listed here. So that's something we should consider. I've already been asked a question if we need the grid at all, we could in principle do everything in an HPC site. Um, that's probably more efficient. I don't know if the funding model uh, allows us to do this, but you know these are the kinds of questions that we will reconsider um, when we update this this document. Um, just just one more mention: the data rate, 280 megabytes per basically event. Uh, that's a bit large. That's mostly driven by the forward colorimeters. That normally gets compressed. That data. Um, there are some interesting ideas about using those detectors for beam parameter estimation. So that, that would then factor in with how much we can compress and, and you know, lossy compression versus, um, versus non-lossy compression, um, how much, what we can do to, to this data if we want to um, use those detectors for beam parameter estimation. Computing infrastructure, I'm just gonna flash the site here. Uh, basically everything that we do is based on ILC Dirac uh, that's maintained by CERN. Um, we have, Currently, 30 computing sites that are registered to this to the system, and we have 9.5 petabytes total um, that are stored in these different sites in this in this file catalog. Um, and so, this this system is at the moment good enough um, to, I guess, get us through a, a technical design report for the detectors. Then, a word about um, the software. So here you can see a. Uh, uh, in, in, 
I guess a, a drawing of the um, of the inner detectors. These are the, the tracking layers. Uh, so you can see these different modules here, uh, all part of the simulation. So basically, um, most of the physics analysis you see from ILC are based on detailed simulations that have you know this level of of detail in the uh, in the GN4. Um, right. So let's start with the software framework. This is currently based on uh, what's called Marlin. We're in the process of updating this whole framework to DD4HAP. Um, there's a, a link here in this in the slide deck to a tutorial how to use this. And then um, we're moving to this AIDA Innova project um, that, that, like I said, updates the, uh, the framework from, from Marlin to Gaudi. Um, Everything currently is glued together by LCIO. So this allows us to share. Uh, this is LCIO is the, the linear collider input output format. This is our event data model. And this allows us to share data between different experiments. So um, we have just seen in, in Javier's presentation an example where a machine learning model was shared between Atlas and CMS. In the ILC world, we share algorithms, data, reconstruction um, models, all of this stuff, because everything is based on this event data model. So, so um, both of these detectors that we have currently, um, they are based on the same reconstruction algorithms. Uh, and, and so, yeah, this, this is the, the glue that, that kids just puts us together. And as mentioned, we're moving towards um, this key for HAP and, and this, I guess, this next step of, of this TD for HAP uh, idea. Um, which then gets uh, input and, and you know workforce from FCC and from from LHC. Okay, so the other thing that we update is now with this new framework um, acts. I guess is the the big piece that will uh, have access to through this. Um, so this will allow us to you know tap directly into the developments for the LHC tracking and use it in in ILC land. Uh, just a quick word, uh, of course, you've all seen a slide like this or, or this plot, at least. Um, there's a lot of development that we'll need to do. Currently, all our algorithms are uh, sequential. And of course, this doesn't scale. So we're thinking about how, to, how this can happen, how we can parallelize these algorithms. Um, the first step is to do event parallel processing, but that isn't going to scale. So you know we need to parallelize our algorithms as well. And so um, we started thinking about this, but there's a lot of work that, that could happen here and, and where you know new people can bring in new ideas um, to yeah parallelize your, your processing, not just event by event, but also within the event. A quick word on the reconstruction software. Um, our vertex reconstruction is based on ZVTOP. That is the algorithm that was used for the SLD experiment at Slack. Uh, we've spruced that up a little bit, um, improved the treatment of many jet topologies. Um, we've added adaptive vertex fitting, and, and there's some work on jet charge. Um, but there's still a lot that could happen, for example, uh, we have a detector that can do quite nice particle ID that is currently not used in the, in the vertexing yet. So you know, the next step would be to, to uh, marry those two concepts and hopefully improve the um, jet tagging by, by taking advantage of particle ID. Uh, calorimeter reconstruction uh, it was just mentioned that CMS also uses uh, particle flow for the ILC. The whole detector design is based on the particle uh, flow concept. So the, the um, both calorimeters are within the, the coil. Um, and so this, this whole design optimization happened with particle flow in mind. We currently have two main concepts. Pandora PFA is really the workhorse horse that was used for these detector optimization um, processes. 
uh, this is handcrafted and I don't necessarily mean that in a, in a good way. Um, this does give the best performance, but um, it also is an expert tool and, and there's a lot of parameters in there that are really uh, heuristics and, and you know based on empirical studies that make it hard to optimize the detector and just reuse those same parameters. So for, you know, if you have some new detector ideas, uh, this might require quite a bit of tuning. So there's um, some work that could happen here, similar to hyperparameter tuning for machine learning models. Um, it would be nice to have something that does this for, for Pandora PFA a little bit more um, to make this a bit less uh, expert specific. Um, we have another particle flow algorithm that is being developed, that has been developed for a while, um, that is also now moving into the same interface of Pandora PFA. So you can swap out the uh, standard Pandora PFA reconstruction with this and use the same API. Um, one challenge to machine learning in, this, in these detectors is we are really driven by precision. And so these tails matter a lot to the reconstruction and they're of course hard to model. And so this is um, one of the challenges and that's, that's basically why I say this will not be replaced by machine learning algorithms for a while because uh, yeah, this, this is uh, important to model this for the performance understanding. Okay, so then uh, a couple ideas. Um, for improving the reconstruction. So one, one thing I've played with was to get uh, basically convex hull of these cluster shapes and try to use the 3D structure of these showers to improve the, the particle ID. Um, there's other efforts, and this is quite interesting, to uh, use machine learning for improving the energy measurement. So in these calorimeters, the calorimeters are not compensating um, but we can use something that's called software compensation where we identify the electromagnetic component of a hadronic shower and the hadronic component of a hadronic shower and calibrate them differently. And so you have, if you, if you can use this local density of the shower to identify which part comes from, you know, the electromagnetic component versus the, the um, hadronic component, uh, you can improve the energy reconstruction by quite a bit. And so this is um, an interesting idea that is, is starting. There's, again, quite a bit of work um, that could happen here. But these are the kind of ideas you can uh, take advantage of if you have these, these millions of channels in the calorimeter. Uh, this, of course, is nice to improve the energy resolution. Um, this has an uh, immediate effect on the physics. So. Um, one part of it is, is the energy re reconstruction that I just mentioned. Just if you go to higher level reconstruction jet clustering um, also has a big effect. So if you see on the uh, right hand side here, real jet clustering. Uh, so this is a fully reconstructed event Gen 4 um, Z Higgs Higgs. So this is our, our Higgs self-coupling measurement. If we had perfect jet clustering, just getting the particles uh, assigned properly to where they belong in the jet they belong. Uh, you could improve the measurement here by 40%. So this is again, uh, a very nice way where people can come in with new ideas. And uh, this has potentially a very, very large effect on the physics reach of these detectors. And then uh, another machine learning idea is we have this matrix element method. Um, where basically you run a, an event generator behind the scenes and, and do a, a matching between the, the Feynman diagram and, the, um, and the, the detector measurements. And uh, in this rather simple uh, example that they've shown here, um, they've seen a, a bit of an improvement in the uh, signal efficiency and so generalizing this and making this um, applicable to whatever your favorite physics measurement. Uh, again, this is a, there's a lot of opportunity here to improve the, the state of the art. And then just uh, forward looking and, and to, to wrap this up, um, we know that we can 
change the outcome of our machine learning prediction by adding subtle effects um, that look to the human eye like there's almost no change, um, but it has a big effect on the on the machine learning outcome. So we have the same effect or the same subtle effect uh, in our detector. So if we understand um, how the detectors modify our signal from, from what is the true physics process to what's the measured process, um, then maybe we can just subtract that effect, basically like an unfolding of uh, on steroids and improve our, our physics interpretation. Um, and so this is, this is, there's almost no work. This is just, you know, vague ideas uh, for, for other things that um, would have a big effect that um, could happen with these, with these uh, very high fidelity detectors. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's kind of where we are in terms of software and, and computing, what works, what doesn't work, where, where, you know, things exist and where a lot of work could improve the situation that we have. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, hey, thanks, Jan. Um, questions from anyone? Mike. Okay, so so thanks for the you know very interesting talk. I had one question on page twelve. We were talking about the particle flow algorithm, and I guess I don't uh, fully. 12, 13, this one, sorry, is this, this oh, is a different, one, I, have, I added one slide in the, uh, ah, computer oh, was yes. uploaded. So, so this slide. Your, your page 13, I'm looking at page yes. 12 over here, yes. right? Um, so I don't, I'm not familiar with the, 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 the Pandora PFA, but you, you say that you will not, um, that will not be replaced by machine learning algorithms for at least a couple of years. And I think you suggested that that was because outliers and tails matter. I may have, I think that I think that, that that's that's my that's my interpretation of this. That's right. Yes. So so why do you believe that machine learning will not do as well with tails and outliers as um, human tuned? Simply because uh, at, well at some point they will, but it, it's harder because at the moment we train everything with data, and outliers and tails have less data to train on by definition. A uh, human can say, well, I understand that this outlier is actually just noise. And this outlier here is because there's a neutron that scattered off something else and, and takes into account a little bit more physics knowledge. So at some point we'll get there in the, in the machine learning algorithms and you know, we're making progress on that front, but it's going to take some time. Okay, so, so um, let's see if I can reinterpret what you just said in my words. You haven't generated enough Monte Carlo data or enough test beam data yet to do a good job of training. On, on data-driven training, I think that's right. Um, if we augment that with physics and, and understanding, then you need less data. But at the moment, yeah, if you had infinite, if you had infinite statistics to, to train on, then it would do as well. In, in my experience, different type of problem, uh, Machine learning algorithms can look at more data than any human can look at. <laughs> yes. And therefore, they can actually manage the corner cases perhaps a little bit better. Eventually. Eventually, I agree. OK, great. Thank you. And so um, we see a little bit of this already. PFA, Pandora PFA is used in Dune. And there is a, a lot of effort, um, or I guess in, in Microboon even, um, there's a lot of effort on machine learning in, in these uh, liquid argon TPC detectors to replace um, Pandora PFA with, with machine learning. But they've spent, they've spent a while on this. So um, this will take time, but, but I believe eventually this is, this is the way to go. Okay, so uh, I had my hand up. Um, I hope 
Peter, that's all right if I just uh, ask. Yeah, questions. sorry, I can't. I can't see the the audience here. Yeah, no, no, that's I know when you're full screen. That's uh, one of the one of the problems. You need a moderator. Um, so uh, looking at this, um, most of this talk, uh, you were discussing um, the reconstruction uh, algorithms, and you yeah. know, in Iris, Hep, we of course have a very active, innovative algorithms uh, group, which is where most of this would uh, fall. Um, and there, I think, are some potential connection points there. And I also wanted to ask about uh, other aspects, um, and maybe it's just it's just too early to think about them too carefully. But there are things like um, making sure you have enough uh, Monte Carlo, so fast Monte Carlo processes, you know, uh, and simulation. There's I'm also. I'm glad you bring up fast Monte Carlo. There's not enough effort on fast Monte Carlo. Okay. We have Delphi's, which is you know uh, physics level. If you really just want to do com compare an ILC study with a, an LHC study, right. Delphi's is good enough. If you want to do detector design or some more complex physics analysis where you really care about um, uh, tracking, we don't have good fast Monte Carlo. Um, right. So there's, there's a lot of work that could happen. There's a lot of work there. OK, that's interesting. And then um, also uh, um, more along the lines of of I, I don't know what sizes your your data sets are now. I mean, this is a, a linear collider, so you're probably a, a much happier group than those of us uh, who work on LHC experiments uh, to, to first order. But um, is are is that something where you're uh, just parasitically using uh, other ideas in infrastructure? Or is that a place where you're also looking to better understand how to do things? I mean, currently. Um... This is this is this is what we do right now exactly. Uh, we we live in the uh, LHC overheads, so there is dedicated resources at Daisy and at CERN, mm. and everywhere else we just live in LHC overheads. Okay. Um, right. ah, okay, ten petabytes. I apologize, I missed that number. Yeah, no, that, that's that's fine. I, I just flashed this slide. Yeah, um, so so right. there is a data set. The Snowmass data set is hosted at uh, at Slack. They've made available if tens of tens of terabytes. Um, so that's available for playing around right now and getting an, an idea. But in terms of data format, data compression, you know, this this 280 megabytes. Um, how does this translate through the different analysis stages? This is currently based on our large scale production. Um, but if somebody comes in and has a, you know, it, it's based on physics need, right? You, you store you store as much right. data right. as you need to do the physics analysis. Right. right. So this will this will evolve. And if people have ideas for how this can evolve, um, and then I think there's, the there's some interesting ideas there. Okay, now this is this is great. This uh, gives me some uh, more context. And the final thing I wanted to ask about was um, after production, um, the end user analysis. Is is that something that every group is sort of doing on their own right now? It's kind of ad, ad hoc, or is that something the collaboration has come together with a you know a way to do this, a way to apply corrections, a common way to share. Uh, you know, intermediate steps, things like that. So the ILD uh, concept has regular analysis meetings and they have um, a good, so they have these, you know, uh, I forget where I have this, um, the, the uh, for the particle ID, you know, these, these corrections, this kind of stuff, they, they share this regularly. Um, for SID, it's much less organized. Okay. Um, I guess that's that's a short of it. In terms of, in terms of uh, metadata and and you know what what people do with databases, um, uh, conditions databases, this kind of stuff, that's not right. happening yeah. at all at the moment. We we just live in simulation land, right? Yeah. There's there's no. It's uh, probably too too early to think of at that level. Um, yeah. But, uh, all right. Perfect. All right. Thank you. This is a great talk. Thanks. 
as Frank has a comment or yeah yeah i just uh, it's a, I, yeah uh, i just wanted to briefly comment on on this uh, topic of of need for fast uh, uh, fast simulation and actually i would i just wanted to say it, it, there is a bit less need for fast simulation for 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 the iec than or actually a lot less than, than say for for the lhc for example for the ied detector concept we're currently doing what we call a large Monte Carlo campaign, where we produce five times the luminosity that we expect for the total running time at the first energy step, 250 GeV. And we do this right now with full simulation GO4, and it runs for a few months in, yeah, in a small, on a few percent level of, of uh, say, resources compared to the LHC. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a there is some activity going, uh, for example, also at Daisy and in and, and other places where we started to, to use machine learning, GAN based and, and auto encoder uh, technologies to do, say, fast calorimeter simulation, because that's, of course, the biggest bottleneck. So, so my that is of course, something where, of course, we're interested uh, in, in, in everything that the, the rest of the community does, and, and in particular with the, the first talk, yeah, it would it would be great to 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 share tools and knowledge on, on this type of, say, fast calorimeter simulation. Yeah, there's- yeah, Maybe maybe I should, I should uh, specify this. Yeah. What I mean, fast simulation is, what you're talking about is our baseline detector, right? I think what is needed is a parameterized um, simulation where we have a much faster way to evaluate different detector concepts, different detector layouts, um, all of that stuff that that has to happen when you want to build a community that has their own ideas that that you don't want to simulate every iteration of of design layout whatever no, no you're right jan uh, of course delphus is the first step and then we have sgv which uh, is at least a good thing to, to study tracking tracker detector layouts but then if it comes to calorimeter and then particle flow parameterization that is of course notoriously difficult to parameterize yeah. as you know but yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, for the for the fast uh, sim of calorimeters using GANs is uh, extremely active. I think basically every experiment that owns a calorimeter is investigating or close to putting something sometimes into production. And it makes me wonder if there shouldn't be some sort of a dedicated get together to start trading you know, explicitly training ideas between the experiments and setting up some sort of a community. Yeah, I, I fully agree. For example, I mean, uh, tomorrow there's a meeting at CERN with a, with a few groups uh, involved there. It's, uh, I actually, I think it's the SFT group that has started this. Yeah, great. I mean, HSF is, a, or, uh, is, is one possible uh, umbrella for something like that. Absolutely. Mike? So uh, this is a, a, a physics question or a politics question rather than software, but what is the space of the ILC as a project in Japan or perhaps anywhere else? Uh, I remember Snowmass 2001 and the conclusion yes. of all the younger physicists at that point was uh, we want the ILC and we want it now. Yes. The highest priority. Yes. And, you know, the people who are young then are no longer young. Indeed. So, so um, I think the physicists still agree that a Higgs factory is the highest priority. And I think this is, um, this is still the, the common, common thread of, of the international communities, uh, the, the European strategy just made that statement explicitly in, in their um, summary. Um, the ILC, like I said, we hope that this pre-lab will get funded, will get started April 1st next year. That would be great because that is well aligned with the SNOMAS process. Um, when we finish the, the SNOMAS process next year, then we'll have something to show. Um, and, and this would, yeah, this would fit in. So. I guess so, where, where, where is the Japanese government these days is are they ready to put in a significant amount of funding do they have any partners identified or is this 
Um, there are high level talks between um so so they it's this is a difficult question there are high level talks at, at the government level so um the previous prime minister had actually mentioned the ilc in his uh in his uh, campaign the current prime minister is at least briefed on it um the the northern side of japan where this is supposed to live they are very, very interested in getting a, a big facility to, you know, to use infrastructure spending. Yeah. Um, so all of those things are starting to fall into place. I think for Japan, they are concerned about um, spending a lot of money and then nobody comes. That, I think that's my understanding is, is that's the biggest concern. So if they are convinced that other people will join and will contribute at the at the appropriate levels, um, then this has a high chance of happening. And so I guess what, what would an appropriate just, level be? I mean, is this so? So I mean, the, the this require a is, large, I guess, a marginal investment by the worldwide high energy physics community, or does this fit into a um, quasi steady state budget scenario? Meaning we keep so, up with inflation internationally, but we don't need new money. Right. So, so I guess the the idea is that this would be funded, you know, fifty percent for the host nation ish, and uh, the rest is shared by the international community. So, I guess in, in terms of physics, um, a, a very. I think attractive way to fund this would be uh, infrastructure by Japan, and then the physics experiment, the accelerator on the experiment, would be uh, 30 for Japan, 30 for the US and, and Americas, and, and 30 for Europe. And the rest, whatever, 10% the, the rest of the world. Okay, thank you. So I'm sure that this particular discussion will play out again over the next. Uh year as we pick up snow mass the snow mass process again yeah like like i said this this um april 1st this is really the the key date to look out for um yeah this this if the pre-lab happens by then this is this is would be a serious investment um and this would be a you know the, the seed for actually building the international contracts Okay, so this was this was actually really great and informative. Um, we're Thank kind you. of over time, and so probably we should stop here, I think. But this was nonetheless quite informative to um, sort of give us the picture of where you are today and where you're going in the near future. So that helps. Um, so I guess thanks uh, for the presentation. Thanks to everyone for participating, and more soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks very much, John. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.